Welcome back to our last lesson together in this series, A Tale of Two Crowns, the Gospel Story Through the Scriptures. We have been seeing God's whole word with new eyes over the last four lessons, snapshots of salvation as the Old Testament foreshadows Christ and his work for us. And I think we have stand amazed at how we see Christ on every page of this book. And I pray that as we go forward together, we will never look at the word of God the same way. We will never look at the living word of God in Christ the same way. And we need to end where the story of the gospel ends and continues for all eternity. And so today we're looking at a powerful story, the resurrection re-envisioned. Well, we've been saying that a picture is worth a thousand words and a moving picture even more so. So we have used pictures throughout this study, talking about how they're written in epic stories, how they are used in movies, and even last week, a personal portrayal of Christ, an actor who had to play Christ, and gave the story of how he came to know Christ in such a deep way. We've used all of these stories to illustrate the larger story, the greater story of the Word of God as it unfolds and demonstrates for us the story of Christ. Today, I want to illustrate with something closer to home and closer in heart. It's my story of picturing Christ from the time I was little. So I remember as a little girl at five years old, this was the album that sat on my lap as I sat on the floor of our living room and I would play this every day. And these sisters who formed a trio became part of my forever family as they sang songs that taught me about Jesus. The songs I remember to this day, and I can listen to them on YouTube, and if I even hear the music, I'll begin to cry. Wounded for me. Wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Calvary conquered my heart. There's room at the cross for you. Drinking at the springs of living water. And my little heart filled with that truth. I was still five years old. Uh, as my mom and grandma took us to the L.A. area for a vacation to go to Disneyland. But on the way, we stopped at Forest Lawn Memorial Park, where there is a stunning exhibit of the Passion of the Christ there in Glendale, California. First, there's a stained glass replica of Da Vinci's Last Supper that is huge and incredibly beautiful. And then we went to the Hall of the Crucifixion Resurrection, displaying two of the largest paintings in the world at the time. The first painting here of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, and then the great painting of the resurrection with all the saints in heaven looking as the Lord comes out of that empty tomb. And again, my heart thrilled to all that the Lord had done for me. I was also five years old when this series came out, the Panorama Bible Study. This is my parents' copy of the study that's on the second coming of Jesus. And I used to sit again on that same floor and open these pages in my little five-year-old lap. And they are full of pictures of what is going to happen in the end times when Jesus returns. And again, the Lord opened his word before me in such a profound way. And my little heart could hardly hold it. When I was eight years old and we were living in Illinois, we traveled to a church that was almost an hour from us to have church on Sundays. And that church had a Sunday school campaign. Do you remember the days when they used to do that to encourage people to come to church every week? Mm -hmm. And what they did was they gave us a little white box and they told us that if we came every week, every week, we would get our own piece of the Holy Land. And oh my word, you tell me something that's a treasure, it may have looked like this, but to me it was that. It was a treasure chest, and boy, I dragged my family every week to get my little piece of the Holy Land. And this is what I got. I got an olive leaf from Gethsemane. I got a stone from Golgotha. They gave us an acacia wood, little tiny cross, Dead Sea salt. And then there were these little bottles 
One of them had water from the Sea of Galilee. Oh my word. And the other one, water from the Jordan River. I kept that box until just a few years ago when it absolutely fell apart. For over 50 years, I've had that box, uh, not very far from me, where I study the Word of God because God allowed me to have a piece of the history of His land that I loved so much. My favorite Bible story as a little girl was Mary at the tomb of Jesus. And whenever I saw my grandma, I asked her to tell me that story again and again and again. I was a child sitting with the Savior, stunned by the pictures of all he did for me. I heard and saw, touched and savored, experiencing the death and resurrection in a powerful way. And it forged my faith. And it reminds me of what John said, and this is our theme verse today from 1 John 1, 1 and 2. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Do you catch what John just said there? He didn't say Christ brought us eternal life. He said Christ was eternal life. And I think we have experienced that through this study. And I am so thrilled to have been able to share it with you. So today we are re-envisioning the resurrection. And I'm going to invite you to step into the theater with me as a child again. God's great hall of the death and resurrection. Feel and see the Holy Land. Hear the music of life. Listen to the story of Mary and others as they experience resurrection power. There is nothing like the wonder of a child. And again, as I told you, God spoke this word to me as we began this study together, and wonder awaits. And it has every single week, and I pray that it will for you today. So come with me one more time. Gaze upon the grace of Golgotha and the glory of an empty tomb as we hear the old, old story in a whole new way. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Father, we thank you for the truth Jesus, the truth, the way, the truth, the life. We thank you for the reality that no one comes to the Father but by him and the sacrifice that he gave for us. But Father, I thank you today that there is a tomb that is empty and will stay empty and that someday he is coming in the clouds and we will meet him in the air and so we will ever be with the Lord. Father, may that life so fill our hearts today as we hear the truth that you have given us not only life, but life more abundantly, and not only life more abundantly, but life that is eternal. Father, open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things in your law now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, take your notes with me and follow along because we are going to go on a ride that is much better than Disneyland. Let me tell you, after that trip, I love Disneyland, and it said that that's the happiest place on earth, but there was nothing like what happened to me when I sat in that theater and saw the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants to take us today through the scriptures to see one more time how that story is written from Genesis to Revelation. So the first thing I want you to see today is there is life from death. Life from death. Look at what John 3.36 says. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. This is a profound truth that God has revealed to us, and I finally fully understood it this week as I wrote this out for you. We have not received life instead of death, but life from death. So follow with me. Look at what Ephesians 2, 1 says. When you were dead in trespasses and sins, he made you alive with Christ. John 5, 24 when we believe, Jesus said, we cross over from what? Death to life. Here's what I want you to hear today. We all start out dead. The wrath of God remains on all who reject. That changes the way we can look at the resurrection of Jesus. Can you not appreciate that you don't start out alive? You start out dead. 
it also changes our motivation for how we look at the world around us. Uh, because people are not living the dream. They're not getting on with life. They're not waiting to think about death until it really matters. They are living dead. And if you and I would understand that, every time we go to the grocery store and we look at people, dead. Those kids playing in your cul-de-sac, dead. That neighbor who brings you uh, a goodie and that you talk to and you know help them take out their trash, dead. Apart from Christ. Your family who doesn't know him, dead. This would change the way we live as believers on this side of eternal life if we understood this principle. And I don't think I ever got it that way until this week. So as we think about life from death, we're going to look at some twos of scripture again that illustrate this for us. And the first one is there are two gates. There are two gates involved in the crucifixion of Jesus. So crucifixions took place between two gates of Jerusalem along a main road in and out of the city so that Rome could make an example of rebels and incite fear in the masses. So remember, we looked at maps the last couple weeks, and I want to remind you, Herod's palace, where, where um, Pilate tried Jesus, and Herod did as well, has a gate right here that goes out to a main road, and that gate is the garden gate. The gate over here uh, on the main road is the Damascus gate. And so we're going to talk about both of those gates now, because some scholars believe that Jesus was crucified here between the gates. Some believe he was crucified just off of the Damascus gate there. Either way, these are the two gates that were in play along the main road. Here's what I want you to see about that. The first, the Ganoth or garden gate. The door to the king's garden in Herod's palace. Christ paid the penalty of death at the entrance to a garden. I want you to see and understand that because this takes us back to Eden. It takes us back to that only entrance to Eden where angels guarded the entrance with a flaming sword that passed back and forth. And when Christ came to die for us, he died at the garden gate in Jerusalem. And what a reminder that is to us of the price that he paid to bring us all back to Eden again for all eternity. Then let's talk about the Damascus gate because this is the gate that Christ would have passed through as he was carrying his cross and bearing that crown of thorns all the way to Calvary. Damascus means sack of blood resembling burning. Now I never understand why people name things the way they do in scripture, but that's literally the name of Damascus. I want you to think about that in terms of Jesus. Christ exited this gate carrying his cross as he prepared to pour out his blood and experience the burning of hell's fire in judgment, according to Lamentations 1, 13. I want you to notice this gate is crowned unlike any other gate of Jerusalem. And the one who was crowned with thorns passed through death's gate to hell to crown us with eternal life. That is a powerful picture just in the gate itself. Two gates. The second thing I want you to see today is there are two hills when we talk about life from death. Judas hung from a tree on the hill of evil counsel. Now, no joke, that's what it's called to this day, the hill of evil counsel. It's called that because it's known as the place Caiaphas, the high priest, took evil counsel with other leaders to kill Jesus and the hill of hanging for Judas, who listened to the evil counsel of Satan to betray Jesus. Again, we've talked about the Kidron Valley where David and Jesus crossed on their way to Gethsemane. It butts up against the Hinnom Valley, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And this field of blood was so named because the 30 pieces of silver were taken to buy it to be a burial place for foreigners. This is the hill or the Mount of Evil Council right here. And this is where Judas chose to die. I want you to see that it is in the Hinnom Valley here also called Gehenna, the place where Israel sacrificed their children to Baal and Moloch. It's a place of evil, bloodshed, and fire. In fact, it was a burning garbage dump in the time of Jesus and thus became the earthly representation of hell. Jesus refers to it as Gehenna. You'll see that in the Gospels. And when he talks about the place of outer darkness, he is literally referring to this place. 
Isn't that interesting that this is where Judas chose to end his life? It is in view of another hill, the Mount of Corruption, or the Mount of Offense, or the Hill of Offense, which is just right there. And what I want you to see is that's the place where Solomon raised pagan temples in honor of his idolatrous wives. These places are still named this way today, rising from the Kidron Valley called the Valley of Judgment, representing those who chose to bear hell's judgment. Judas hung on hell's hill with two views, one looking toward corruption, bearing his own offense, and one looking toward Golgotha's grace. And what I want you to see in this map is you can tell the topography of Jerusalem. So Judas died here on the Mount of Evil Council. It's a high point in Jerusalem. The Mount of Corruption over here toward the Mount of Olives, also a high point. Golgotha, where Jesus died, also a high point. That means that literally Judas could look across and see the hill of offense and the Mount of Corruption, hell, Golgotha's grace, heaven. What an incredible vantage point both ways. And the question today is, which way will each of us choose, heaven or hell? Judas chose the wrong hill, the wrong tree, the wrong perspective. Jesus hung on a tree on a hill to overcome evil with good. And as I've been teaching you through these studies, Hebrew is a pictographic language as well as an alphanumeric language. I want to share with you the Hebrew pictograph meaning of the word good. It means safe and secure within the boundary of the house or son of God. That was the problem in the Garden of Eden. They had the tree of life. They had good. They had the Father's direction. They had never known anything but the Lord showing them good things. And when Eve chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that changed. And it was in effect, she was saying, you know what, this may not be good for me, but I'm going to choose evil because it feels good to me. And Judas listened on the, the hill of evil counsel. He listened to evil counsel. So I want you to think carefully about that today because you are going to hear evil counsel every single day. Every time you go on social media, every time you turn on the TV or the radio, every time sometimes you listen to Christian people talk about their perspective on things, there's the potential for Satan to take that and twist it and throw you a bone of evil counsel. Are, are you aware of that? Listen carefully. And so the two questions for me from these two hills are this. Will you choose heaven over hell? And the second is, will you listen to the Lord for what is good? Those are the lessons we learn from these two hills. Then there are two births that explain to us life from death. And again, this may make more sense to us spiritually after we hear this. We are physically born into death, then spiritually born again into life. Look at what 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is why Jesus declared to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is what? Born again. This is the happiest place in the hospital. It used to look exactly like this when my girls were born. There was still a nursery with all the babies that had come and all of the gasping, gaping families were standing there just looking at their pride and joy treasure. This is the happiest place that you could possibly be. But if you told any of these family and friends that these little ones were dying, they would be horrified that each held not promising life but the penalty of death. This is the picture that we should get. This is the saddest place in a cemetery. This is the children's cemetery. You can find it in every cemetery and you'll recognize it because it's colorful compared to the rest of the cemetery. That's interesting. But you need to understand that when we hold a newborn baby, we think we're holding life. But in reality, because of sin, we're holding a soul destined for death. 
unless they are born again. And so this should change the way we think about what Jesus said and why he said it with such intensity, why he said, you must be born again. So please hear me clearly again. You are not alive until you are dead. You are dead until you are made alive. So again, the question that I would ask concerning that is, have you truly been born again? And is the evidence of this brand new you growing up to be like your heavenly father? Because being born again means you have new genetics and you are to hold the image and the nature and the likeness of your new father. What a beautiful picture that is of life from death. But wait, there's more. There's not one breath in scripture, there's two breaths. Ezekiel 37, five and six reminds us of this. This is what the sovereign Lord says to those dry bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So follow with me here. After God created Adam, he breathed into him. He breathed on him and man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7 tells us that. In Eden, God walked with man in the cool of the day, it says in Genesis. That word cool in Hebrew is ruach. It's the breath of God. That means that Adam had the breath of God in him. He walked with God in his living breath. Even the breezes that blew through Eden were the breath of God. The breath of God in his life was everywhere. Now, are you ready for the second breath? After Jesus recreated life from death, he breathed on his disciples, giving life to their souls. Again, this is part of the resurrection we never talk about. Look at what John 20, verses 19 through 22 says. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And when you were born again, the breath of God came back into an eternal breath. The Holy Spirit, the holy breath is actually the, what it means. The holy ruach that is in you all of the time. Now God's presence breezes through you with every living breath you take. And then there are two empty tombs, not just one. Again, this is an incredible, beautiful picture of what the Lord has done for us. Remember I told you last week, Joseph's tomb would never be used again. It had never been used before, but after Jesus used it, it could never be used again. Why? Because a tomb could not be filled with unrelated people, according to Hebrew law. So it would always be the empty tomb of Jesus as a lasting testimony and triumph. That is cool just by itself for you and I to realize that today. But there are two tombs of Joseph. So follow with me. When God's people exited Egypt, representing the old life of slavery, they left behind the empty tomb of Joseph, who asked for his body to be taken to the promised land. Did you know that? They didn't leave anything else behind except the empty tomb of Joseph. When they crossed from death to life and went on to the promised land. When Christ died, ending our old life of slavery to sin, he left behind the empty tomb of Joseph. And one day he will take our bodies to the promised land of heaven. Now, it gets better. In Egypt, Joseph was known as Joseph of Rama, which is transliterated Arimathea. While Egypt was filling tombs with fallen sons after that last plague of death, Israel leaves behind the empty tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph of Rama. And Jesus would leave behind an empty tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. You can't make this stuff up <laughs> like this is in history. It is recorded as history. It is recorded in the word of God. It is scientific, it is sensory, it is literature. However your mind works, 
God has embedded in his word and in historical record all around the world exactly what he has done. But there are other two empty tombs as well, and I want you to see that today because it matters for you. On the day that Jesus was resurrected, Jesus' tomb was empty, but so was Barabbas' tomb because Jesus had stepped in for him and he was alive. On the day that Jesus rose from the grave, Jesus' tomb was empty, but so was the tomb of Lazarus because Jesus had raised him from the dead and he was alive. And on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus' tomb was empty, but so was the tombs, multiple tombs of the first fruit witnesses, those who were raised from the dead when Jesus died. And it says, and after the resurrection, they came into Jerusalem and testified about him. Can you imagine? All were raised to life as assurance that you will be as well. So my question is, what needs to be raised in you today and stirred to new life? Because there's not one empty tomb, there's two. And because there are two, you can live. Life from death. The second thing I want you to see today, <coughs> excuse me, is abundant life. It's not just that Christ came to give you life. He came to give you life abundantly. That's what he says in John 10.10. 10. I've given you the Amplified here because I want you to see it. He said, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I want you to see that today because I think sometimes as Christians, we don't feel the abundance that God died to give us. And so I want you to see some more twos today that illustrate for us this abundant life. And the first is there were two Sabbaths. God labored for six days, bringing forth creation. Then he rested from all his work on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Christ died on the sixth day, bringing forth a new creation. Then he rested from all his work of salvation on the seventh day, the Sabbath, as he lay in the tomb. The writer of Hebrews makes clear that our salvation actually is a Sabbath rest. And the only work left for us to do is to make every effort to enter that rest by believing and receiving God's gift of grace through the sacrifice of our Savior. You can read that in Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. But I want you to see that today the gift of Sabbath is the gift of resurrection life. You know, Jesus died on Passover, was buried and lay in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, was raised to life on the Feast of First Fruits. Even in that, there were three Sabbaths in a row because all three feasts have to be a Sabbath day. That means that we all rested while Christ did the work of salvation. That's why you can't earn it. You can't do anything to earn your salvation. Hebrew says the only thing you work at is to work to enter the rest of Sabbath that Christ gave you in the work that he did. Isn't that beautiful? Two Sabbaths. Because Christ did all the work, we can have rest, peace, wholeness, and blessing as we become a new creation. That is life abundantly. But then I want you to see there are two arcs. First, there was an ark of grace. Just as Noah's ark was made out of wood and nails, a refuge of salvation for his family, so Jesus would provide through a cross made out of wood and nails, a refuge of salvation for God's family. Now, I want you to see the name Noah in Hebrew. And again, I want you to th see it in 3D, the pictographic meaning, the actual meaning, and the numeric meaning. Noah in 3D. The word means comfort and rest. The pictogram means life in a place of refuge. The numeric meaning of Noah's name is 50 and 8. That stands for jubilee and a new beginning. Even Noah's name would reveal what he would do in building the ark, but even more than that, what Jesus would do when he would bring comfort and rest, life in a place of refuge, and a jubilee in our lives and a new beginning because of the cross. It's an ark of grace. But it's also an ark of glory. There's an ark of glory in God's word. Just as the Ark of the Covenant, which signified the living presence of God, was topped with the blood-stained mercy seat, 
with two angels on either side. So the risen Savior was the living presence of God. When the temple veil was torn in two at his death, we gained access to the holiness of heaven. When Mary Magdalene looked in the empty tomb, she saw something nobody else saw. If you read all the resurrection accounts, you'll see the angels moved around. One was sitting on the stone. They were standing outside. They were in different places. But when Mary Magdalene looked in, she saw something nobody else saw. Two angels on either end where Jesus had laid the blood-stained mercy seat of the ark in between. I want you to understand that because there are some lessons for Mary and for us in these just these moments that she looked into the empty tomb and she talked to Jesus. The mercy seat Mary saw, you can read about it in John 20. You are completely covered, not only with God's grace, but with his glory. The mission on which Mary was sent when she recognized Jesus, he said to her, do not touch me, but go and tell. Go and tell. And that is the mission for us today. And do you realize that just as a woman, Eve, had allowed death to come, now a woman would announce life had come. And that's why that happened that way. I want you to see the majesty Mary honored. When she realizes it's Jesus and not just a gardener, she cries out, it says. Okay, she doesn't say. She cries out, Rabboni in Aramaic, Adonai in Hebrew, my Lord. That's interesting because in the Hebrew, it should be Adon, master, not Adonai. That's plural. Why plural? Because when you see a plural in Hebrew, it doesn't just mean the word. It means a word with the exclamation marks. It's like a multiplier, a magnifier of the word. It's not holy. It's holy, holy, holy. When she says, Adonai, she's crying out, my Lord, my God, my master of everything. The Lord of everything and my Lord of my everything. I want to cry out when I see an empty tomb, Adonai, my Lord, the majesty Mary honored. And then I want you to see the melding of a forever family. As Jesus says to her, go and tell my brothers, I am returning to my father and your father. Do you know that's the first time Jesus ever referred to his disciples as brothers? Never did he say family until this moment. And what I want you to see in that is as Mary, the mother of Jesus, was given to John literally at the cross. And the gospels say from that moment on, John took her into his house. For the rest of her life, she lived with John, part of her forever family, not one of her sons. And Acts tells us that, that Jesus' brothers came to Christ. They were part of the early church. But Mary was given to John as forever family, and that's where she lived. And we sitting here today, we're forever family. And forever family trumps physical family because this is eternal. This is connected in the DNA of Christ, our brother, and God, our father. And just as Mary was given a new family, now Mary Magdalene would be assured she was part of a new family that would last eternally. Why do I want you to see so clearly this message today? Because I think most Christians spend more time on the cross and grace, but not as much time on the resurrection and glory. And I want to say to you today that the resurrection is more than just one day on Easter. Easter is every day in our lives as believers in Jesus. And that's why when I began my ministry, uh, my international ministry to the world, uh, a number of years ago, the Lord gave me the name Grace and Glory Ministries. It was to be called Grace and Glory Ministries so that every time I taught the Word of God, every time I opened this book and presented it in living color, people would see the grace of the Lord and pass that the glory of the resurrection, the risen Lord and the ascended Lord who rules on high. All of this is ours as we walk in the abundant life he died to give us. And then I want you to see there are two deaths, not just one. We talked about this verse last week, but I want to say it again. Isaiah 53, 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, when we read it in the English, it says in his death. 
the Hebrew text says in his deaths. It's plural, in his deaths. Jesus didn't die a death, he died deaths. He would die deaths, not just one death, but many deaths, all of ours. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, in talking about this term in the Hebrew, says this, every death is contained inside that plural word. It is the witness in black and white that your old life and the judgment thereof is finished. Give that which is old a eulogy and a burial. Be finished with it and be free. Christ died not just his death, he died your death as well. But there's only one life. There's two deaths, but there's only one life. Look at what Colossians 3, 3 says. For you died and your life is now hidden. That means to conceal or cover, to be buried with Christ in God. Paul goes on to tell uh, the church in Galatia, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see it? You don't have a life and Christ lives in you, his life. You only have his life. You stay in the tomb. He comes out and that's why you have abundant life. That is not just theology, ladies. That is a reality. That is a spiritual reality in your life. Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. When it says your life is hidden with Christ in God, you died. For you died. You died. Not Christ. You died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God in that tomb. He comes out. You stay in. That is why we have baptism. And that is what baptism represents. Look at Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It is his life in us. And in order to live the abundant life, Christ has to live his life through you. It's his life. What a beautiful picture that is. And then I want you to see there are two scars in this abundant life as well. Jesus has always borne the scars of your salvation. I know we've talked about it, but I want you to hear it again. The lamb was slain before the creation of the world, Revelation 13, eight tells us, before the foundation of the world. Jesus let Thomas see and touch his scars in John 20, 27, and Revelation 5, six tells us the lamb slain is at the center of the throne. Do you know what that means? God's plan A was Christ bearing scars for you. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world in God's mind. He was slain in real time 2,000 years ago and for all eternity we will not see Christ in bodily form only as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He will be a lamb slain for all eternity in the center of God's throne. We will see these scars that he bore for us because it's all about this work. But you know what? You will sometimes bear his scars of salvation. And part of the abundant life is fellowshipping and sharing in his sufferings. Look what Paul says in Galatians 6, 17. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my bodies the marks of Jesus. When you suffer, you are doing so along with Christ. You are fellowshipping. You may not understand the hardships in your life. You may not understand the woundings, but we bear the marks of Jesus. There are scars that we will bear as a result of fellowshipping with him. But here's what I want you to see in that. Paul said, even in his thorn in the flesh, when I am weak, his power rests or hovers on me. That's the same picture of God's presence hovering over his people in the wilderness in a pillar of cloud and fire. It's the same as God's presence that filled the temple in 2 Chronicles 7. And then Paul said about our sufferings, as I participate in Christ's sufferings, his glory is more clearly seen in me. Romans 8, 18, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. This is what I want you to always remember about your scars. Scars are not a sign of wounding. They're a sign of healing. Even in suffering, he gives abundance, fellowship, 
of sharing in Christ's sufferings, abundant grace that is sufficient, power that hovers over you in weakness, glory that is seen in you as you suffer well with his sufficient grace. What an incredible picture for us. Even in our suffering, there is abundant life. And the last thing I want you to see today as we wrap up is eternal life. There is life from death. There is abundant life as a result of the resurrection. And there is eternal life for those who trust Jesus. Look what John said in 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Do you know as a minister to women around the world, I often will ask a woman the question, are you sure? Are you sure that you will be in heaven someday? And do you know what I am told more times than not? I think so. I hope so. I am rarely told I know so. And I just want to make that point. John said, we write these things to you to testify so that as you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, you will know. And I want you to know that today. And so there are two feasts that remind us of the eternal life. And these are the two feasts that happened as Jesus was buried and resurrected. The week of Passover contains three Old Testament feasts in a row that Christ perfectly fulfilled. And two of them he fulfilled through his burial and resurrection, picturing eternal life. The first is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Just as God's people leaving Egypt celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread to remember that they were to be free from the corruption of the leaven of sin, so Jesus lay buried in a tomb on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But his body did not decay, a sign of corruption, since he was sinless, free from leaven. You may never have understood that verse in the scripture. Why in the world does it say he will not see corruption and his body will not decay? Because he was the sinless son of God and this is the feast of unleavened bread. And he is in the grave, not decaying during that feast. That's incredible. This pictures for us the freedom we can have from sin now and the fullness of eternal life we will have one day completely released from all effects of sin. The second feast that Jesus fulfilled in his resurrection is the feast of first fruits. Now again, track with me. Matthew 27, 50 through 53 says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at the moment that he died, the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Why? Because on the feast of first fruits, every man of Israel was to present an offering at the temple, the first gathering of new grain representing the whole harvest that would come, according to Leviticus 23. Jesus was raised to life on the feast of first fruits, the first fruit of resurrection, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15:23. And he brought his offering of the first gathering of heaven's harvest, believers who would live eternally. That's why I think he said in John 12, 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And all those little bitty seeds came out of their graves when Jesus died and this was his First fruit wave offering before the Lord. And I believe that he took them to heaven with him that day. I'll talk about it in a minute. And waved them before the Lord. And I believe they were the first fruit offering. Guaranteeing you that you as well will be raised to life. And that you will be before the Lord. Not just your soul. Body and soul. And given a new body for all eternity. How cool is that? But as we look at that, I believe there are two ascensions. Not just one. So again... Many Messianic scholars believe that after his resurrection, Jesus ascended to heaven as high priest to apply the blood of our salvation to the altar of the heavenly temple, completely fulfilling God's law, then returned to earth to be with his disciples for another 40 days. Now, think about this with me. What did Jesus say to Mary in John 20, verse 17? Jesus said, do not touch me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. This makes no sense because he doesn't ascend to heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne on high until 40 days later. He sees the disciples. They touch him. Thomas touches his side. He invites that. What is this? This means that there has to be an ascension and then Jesus has to come back. And I believe this is the ascension when as high priest, he literally applies his blood in the same way that in Levitical law, they did this every single day. They did it once a year on the day of atonement when they went to the Ark of the Covenant, the high priest, and he applied blood one, one time. And Hebrews says, and instead of that, Christ applies it once for all, applies it. We see so many pictures of this, but I want you to see it as the writer of Hebrews describes it. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle in heaven. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is, once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. That's Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. You can also read Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 and see this picture again. This is to give us confidence in a firm faith so that we can come boldly before God's throne of grace. And I want you to hear this in some of our favorite verses of scripture, but we never put them together this way. I want you to hear Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, again, whenever you see this word through the heavens, this is an ascension too. Okay, this is the high priest going to the temple. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is why the temple veil was rent in two. This is why it was opened up, so the Ark of the Covenant would be available to you. And prayer warriors, I want you to understand today that when you pray, you come straight through that tabernacle because of Jesus' blood and you are at the Ark of the Covenant. You are in the presence of the glory of the Lord. And your prayers are powerful because he has ascended, not once, but twice. And then I want you to see that ascension that we are familiar with, the second one. Jesus then ascended to sit at the right hand of the throne of God as King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, exalted and ruling above all, powerful and preeminent for the rest of time and eternity. I want you to understand that today because Jesus is not going to rule and reign. Jesus does rule and reign. Now, when he ascended and sat at the right hand of the throne on high, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords today. We act as if Satan is in charge of this world. Satan's not in charge of this world. He's a prince. The king of kings is in charge of this world. And even Satan has to ask permission to sift you. Satan has to ask permission to allow things to come into your life. Christ, the ascended Lord, seated at the right hand of the throne on high. And as he ascended, his disciples asked him a question. Are you going to restore Israel now? Is this the end time? Is this the fulfillment of all prophecy? And you know what Jesus said to them? Don't look at a calendar. Look after the commission I'm giving you. He said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Lord, the Father, has in his power, but you will be my witnesses. Don't concentrate on all the jots and tittles of how things are happening. Concentrate on this commission that the Lord gave you. And as Jesus ascended, there was the reminder of that commission. And I want you to see there are two commissions as we close today. It's important. The original commission given to Adam and Eve. Look at Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them, what? Rule, Rule over all the earth. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply, fill the earth. And what? Subdue it, rule for me over it. Now I want you to look at our commission that the Lord Jesus gave. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority 
in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, subdue them, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you, even to the very end of the age. Did you know that commission in Matthew did not take place where Jesus ascended? We always put this together. It didn't. He said to Mary, go and tell my brothers, I'm ascending to my father and your father, but tell them to meet me in Galilee. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 was given in Galilee. It's called Galilee of the Gentiles. He made his disciples walk 150 miles round trip to give them this message to go into all the world in the place where he ministered most to Gentiles. It's called Galilee of the Gentiles. The Samaritans nearby were half-breeds. The Decapolis on the other side of the Sea of Galilee comprised of Roman city-states. Many Roman citizens and soldiers resided there. In that very place, he fed 4,000. Okay, he fed two crowds, 5,000 and 4,000. 4,000, four, the number representing the whole world. He fed them in the land that was called the land of the seven, representing the seven pagan tribes of Canaan, representing the commission to go into all the world. He sent 70 disciples out to preach the gospel in Luke 10, representing the 70 nations of earth in Genesis 10. Do you see it? The great commission to go into all the world. But in Acts 1, it tells us the, that he ascended from the Mount of Olives. Now we're back in Jerusalem. So he took them all the way to Galilee of the Gentiles to give them the Great Commission and remind them, do not stay in Jerusalem. Do not stay in your home. Do not stay in your neighborhood. Do not stay in your city where you're most comfortable. Get out and take it to the ends of the earth. And that's what we need to hear today. Did you know that the ascension is more tied to the resurrection in the New Testament than just the resurrection by itself. He is not just risen, but he is ruling now. And then the scriptures say in Acts that as he was blessing them, he was taken up to heaven. Did you see? God blesses Adam and Eve. Jesus blesses his disciples. God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful. Jesus says to his disciples, go into all the nations and make disciples. To Adam and Eve, multiply. Jesus says, multiply. Bring them in, grow them to Adam and Eve, subdue the earth. To the disciples, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. You go and teach them to obey me, subdue them, to obey me, to be part of me. And then again, all authority. His authority has been given to you to pray, to proclaim, to powerfully work wonders so that those under the curse of death will be made alive in Christ. He blessed them to go forth and rule and reign because he is risen indeed and is Lord of all. And now we are the standard bearers of that message and we are the storytellers of this great truth of the gospel. How are you stewarding that today? With power and on purpose? As we close today, I wanna to remind you there are two portraits in this theater two pictures constantly being demonstrated in our lives, the power of the Christ, the power of his cross, and the power of his resurrection. So I wanna ask you, have you seen and heard and touched the risen Lord in a fresh way today? Did you know that Jesus appeared alive eight times after his resurrection? Eight, the number of new beginnings to assure you that you have life from death, abundant life, eternal life. So are you living it? Are you freely, fully alive? May you and I walk in the wonder of the Lamb of God who is the living Lord all our days because we have gazed upon his grace and glory in these days together. The Lord bless you. Let's pray. Father, we are stunned at the word made alive before us. 
both in the living word of God that is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce to the innermost parts of our life and separate and bring us into alignment and order to your life. Father, I pray that every inch of the scriptures that we have covered would become real in our life and that the commission we carry would be released in greater and greater ways in the days ahead to go forth from this place and share that we are not alive until we're dead. We are dead in our trespasses and sin until we are made alive, born again in you, and you will literally breathe the breath of life into us again. Father, those of us who know the Lord Jesus and have that breath within us, the precious Holy Spirit, the breath of God, May he breathe on us right now in such a fresh way that we will be anointed and appointed again to go forth and to give this glorious good news to everybody we come in contact with. Father, take this message even to the very ends of the earth. I pray as you bless them, as you ascended, that you would bless this study and that you would take it forth as precious seed and that you would spread it to the nations. And Father, may many be transferred from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of light and life in Jesus Christ. We love you. We honor and cherish you. We lift you high for worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive all glory and honor and wisdom and power and strength. Lord Jesus, thank you for these one theater, these two paintings, this, this incredible picture of your death and resurrection. And thank you that you are not only risen indeed, you are ruling and reigning as the ascended Lord, seated at the right hand of the throne on high. May we take the authority you have given us. May we pray it, may we proclaim it, may we walk purposefully in it, and may others see and know you as the lamb who was slain in the center of God's throne. In Jesus' name.